right here is a tape player with some um, Kansas City standard data recorded on it. So let's see if we get data. It'll be loud. We have data. We are reading it. Awesome. So this is a cassette tape brand new in its wrapper. And uh, we're gonna try to figure out how this was used back in the day to store data for computers. Uh, I don't know if you guys remember, but when I was a kid um, watching a program or a video game load on a Commodore 64 from a tape, fascinating to me because it was the same tapes that I was using to listen to music and record music. So anyways, if you're interested, stay tuned. So in 1976, a whole bunch of computer gurus from the early uh, computer age, uh, including Bill Gates, uh, got together at a symposium in Kansas City to come up with a standard for uh, recording digital data on audio cassettes, uh, plain old audio cassettes that everybody could afford. And they come up with the Kansas City standard, uh, which basically was as follows. Uh, digital ones were recorded as uh, 2.8 cycles of a 2.4 kilohertz signal. Digital zeros were recorded as a uh, total of four cycles of a 1.2 kilohertz signal and um, the data would be presented as UART format uh, with the line being high and then going low for a start bit followed by eight bits of data which were in the least significant bit first uh, format uh, and then afterward, the stop bit just meant that the line would go high again. So there would be two stop bits um, at the end of every data cycle. Um, and the entire data cycle would uh, basically be at 300 bits per second or 300 baud. Using these audio frequencies, each bit would take precisely 3.33 milliseconds to complete. And as you can see, this is a sample of audio data uh, that comes out on Kansas City standard encoding. This is from a sample recorded uh, from my iPhone, uh, which basically um, shows the audio stream. It's a sine wave uh, around the zero volt line, and the um, signal is very weak. It's uh, uh, 0 0.2 volts uh, peak to peak. And so the first thing to do is to amplify it and get it to be between zero and five volts. And so the way to do that is uh, simply using an op amp with a very aggressive um, gain. So in this case, the gain is 101. Uh, and this basically amplifies the signal and brings it between zero and uh, 3.9 volts or so and eclipse it because of the aggressive uh, gain of the circuit. Because the op amp is between zero and five volts, it never goes all the way to five volts. So to get it there, we put it through an inverter and uh, that gets it between zero and five volts peak to peak and a square wave. Once we have a nice clean digital signal, basically a five volt peak to peak square wave centered between zero and five volts, uh, we have to use uh, this next implementation, which is a re-triggerable re uh, 555 monostable multivibrator. And I did a previous video on this where I explained how it works. But basically, what is needed here is the ability to re-trigger the signal uh, and have the pulse, uh, the resulting pulse, be short enough that it is not re-triggered by the fast uh, cycled clock and long enough that it does actually time out 
during the long uh, pulses or the longer periods of the 1.2 kilohertz signal. As you can see here, during the fast uh, frequency signal, the capacitor keeps getting re-triggered or discharging, and so it never reaches the uh, two-thirds voltage point, and so the output always stays high because of that. So in order to test this, I first had to recreate the 2.4 kilohertz and 1.2 kilohertz signals. So to do this, I basically used a CD4106 um, inverting Schmidt trigger with a um, 6.8 nanofarad capacitor and approximately 87K uh, uh, resistor. And basically when you put these uh, together in the CD4106, you get a 2.4 kilohertz signal. And then using a divide by two toggle circuit with a D flip-flop, you can make a 1.2 kilohertz signal. And you can see that at pin six, that capacitor keeps discharging as the circuit gets re-triggered. And on the slow cycle, it actually goes up to that level of voltage. Uh, on the capacitor and the circuit times out so you should get pulses uh, that go low on the 555 timer. Here it is, uh, 2.4 kilohertz apparent signal that's being frequency divided by 2 by this coil rope oscillator and I have a retriggerable monostable 555 timer with a 22k resistor and an 18 nanofarad capacitor and when I plug the input of that into the parent wave which is a 2.4 kilohertz signal I don't have anything at all other than 5 volts coming out so that's not going to trigger anything and that's the way to differentiate between the fast clock and the slow clock, which is precisely at 1.2 kilohertz. So now that we have a completely high signal when the clock is fast and a low signal or low pulses when the uh, clock is uh, at 1.2 kilohertz, we put a second monostable 555 timer, this time with a larger RC constant, 10K and an 82 nanofarad uh, capacitor. And what that does is that is going to be constantly re-triggered uh, by the slow pulses. And the high signal is never going to trigger it. And so the resulting waveform at pin 6, which is the uh, at the capacitor charging, um, you could see... Uh, it never meets the threshold, and that signal is going to be high when the clock pulse is slow. And when it's fast, it's going to be zero. And so you can see the resulting timing diagram at each step of the circuit. And you can see starting with the sine wave, the inverter, and the op amp, and what happens at each of the monostable points. And at the bottom, your result, uh, resulting waveform is basically a high value when the clock is fast and a low value when the clock is at 1.2 kilohertz. So um, that is the reverse of what we want or the inverse of what we want. So the final step in this is just to put it through a simple uh, transistor-based NOT gate, an inverter, and that should give us the serial um, output of data that we're looking for. So the resulting timing diagram uh, can be seen at the bottom here, uh, where each bit is now inverted and the 2.4 kilohertz signal is high and the 1.2 kilohertz signal is low. So we're gonna test this out now and see if it works with some real data. So using the 2.4 kilohertz and 1.2 kilohertz uh, signals that I already have, I put together a quick and dirty circuit where it basically uh, uses a CD4017 counter to clock in eight uh, cycles of the fast clock and basically triggers a D flip-flop to switch back and forth um, that triggers uh, transistors uh, to output either... Um, a slow clock or a fast clock at one bit 
cycles. So eight fast clock pulses and four slow clock pulses uh, in order just to test to see if the monostable uh, multivibrator system works. So the resulting uh, waveform that I came up with to test it mm. is seen here, and it's working just fine Signal as expected. You have alternating um, 2.4 kilohertz uh, signal and a 1.2 kilohertz signal um, at one bit each. So basically uh, 3.33 milliseconds uh, for the entire duration of each um, value. And this should give us a zero one zero one zero one when we Kansas look at it City with standard, our decoder uh, circuit data. with the monostables. So Kansas City standard Here it is once again, bits per second. and it seems to be a stable signal. Are eight cycles. And so now with the Kansas City standard decoder, you could see the alternating zero and one uh, signal on the top, uh, the audio signal, and the resulting waveform of the data signal after it goes through the monostable multivibrators multi and the uh, inverter. And um, you can see that uh, other than the delay, uh, a small delay um, from input to output, uh, it is rock stable with zeros and ones going according to where they need to go. And the duty cycle is uh, even. So um, I think this is working just fine. So now let's try it with some real data. So here's some random data uh, that I found streaming on YouTube in Kansas City Standard. And this is basically the Gettysburg Address um, coded in Kansas City, no, well, sort of Kansas City Standard. It's a uh, most significant bit first and uh, there's no start bit or stop bit or any of that stuff. So it's just like a constant stream of data just to see if uh, it actually, um, if it works uh, for more than just zero one zero one zero one, uh, like I had in my test signal. So let's try to decode this data and see if it's actually accurate. So this is what the data looks like when it first starts. And if you use the ASCII table where, you know, for, for what binary actually stands for, um, it should give you the correct result. And so in this case, here is the coding for uh, the, the word F-O-U-R and a space, uh, which if you know the Gettysburg Address, four score and seven years ago, four is the first word of the Gettysburg Address. So now let's test this out with an actual uh, UART signal, which is the high line followed by the low start bit, eight data bits, least significant bit first, and then followed by two high stop bits. And so uh, for that, I'm going to use a stream of data that's coded 01010101, which codes for U, a good uppercase U, and this is coming from Greg Strike's channel. Uh, he created a four-hour-long test signal of just this, and um, it really is useful in uh, looking at the signal, and here we see a perfectly good UART signal. So now we're going to try to test this with some real data. So now my setup here is I'm using my laptop here, and uh, I have an FTDI cable connected to my USB port, and um, the other side of it is uh, getting the output data signal from my decoder device. The input, the audio input, is going to be coming from a YouTube video um, that I actually found with a complete video game, the Star Trek 1976 video game on YouTube, and the complete um, data signal for the program, which is coded in BASIC, is there. And so in a second, when the audio stream starts, the decoder is going to start seeing data, and the data should be transmitting uh, to through the FTDI cable into the as UART signal um, and should be visualized on the screen um, as the serial data coming in decoded already. Um, and so let's see what we see here. And there it is. There it is. Um, 
a full basic program coming in at 300 bits per second, all coming from that uh, audio stream from YouTube um, with the complete recording. Now, I'm not going to show the complete program here, and I'm not sure if this is copyright material anymore, but uh, since the game is almost 50 years old and not really on a system that's usable, but um, there it is, the Star Trek text-based game um, from 1976 in Kansas City standard format coming in and you could see that the data is um, pretty solid no missed bits no weird characters and uh, here's the oscilloscope representation of the data you can see the audio signal on top uh, coming in pretty straightforward and smooth and so I would say that this decoder um, cassette tape audio data, digi to digital data decoder works fairly well. Um, and uh, it's a relatively straightforward setup here. It's just a FTDI. There's a, those are the connections, and it just plugs into the USB port of, a, of a, any laptop or computer. And uh, there it is. It's still going. The entire... Uh, the entire data audio signal is five minutes long at 300 bits per second. That's a lot of bits coming through. So all in all, it's a fairly easy and functional uh, circuit and easy to build. So here's the schematic. Um, thanks again for watching. Uh, I'll work on an encoder for next time.